Um, I would like to thank everyone um, for joining us today um, for our weekly seminar at the Stanford Institute for Human Centered Artificial Intelligence. Um, <clears throat> today we are very happy to welcome Vinay Uday Prabhu, who will give a talk on the four horsemen of ethical malice in peer reviewed machine learning literature. And um, Vinay is currently the chief scientist at Unify ID Incorporated, where he leads efforts towards architecting and deploying the state of the art passive mobile biometric solution uh, that Unify is developing by bringing together machine learning algorithms and smart sensor data to model the human behind the device. Uh, prior to his work at Unify, he was a data scientist at Albedo, and he's received his PhD in electrical and computer engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. And I'll add, I've been to uh, Unify a couple times and uh, really exciting work going on there that Vinay is leading and uh, definitely a company in the Bay Area to watch. And so I'm really happy to have Vinay here and looking forward to the talk. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Vinay. Uh, thank you so much, Colin, for the kind intro. Um, so yeah, this talk uh, is basically a collection of my thoughts, um, you know, kind of uh, mostly as a practitioner in the field and like a cumulative uh, set of experiences, uh, some days with frustration, some days with confusion. And I'm kind of, uh, this is also part of my outreach to the learned community at uh, Stanford HAI to kind of, uh, you know, come up with a bunch of guidelines. Um, and there'll be a strong focus on uh, the computer vision side of things as far as the machine learning literature is concerned. So let's uh, dive right in. Uh, before uh, we begin, I would like to kind of throw out a, a bunch of caveats. Like I said, these are more, these are to be treated as cliff notes from a practitioner in the belly of the beast. Uh, I have attended uh, uh, every single ICML, NeurIPS, CVPR in the past four years. And this is basically the cumulative sum of my experiences and those conversations that I've had that I thought uh, are worthy to kind of share with a larger audience. Uh, these ex uh, opinions are uh, solely my own. They do not represent Unify IDs. Uh, and this talk is not meant to be an all encompassing literature survey of the critiques of this field. Um, <clears throat> and if you feel that your work is by any chance not being cited, uh, yeah, I would like to kind of apologize a priori for that. Uh, these are, uh, I thought, and it's a, you know, fixed duration talk. So uh, we had to kind of cut down on the number of slides and stuff. Uh, and like I said, stated previously, there's a strong emphasis on computer vision in here. Uh, this is not to say that uh, you know, uh, fields such as uh, NLP and then speech processing uh, basically don't have these issues. In this talk, I'll be focusing more on the computer vision side of things. And I'd like to, uh, you know, thank uh, my awesome collaborators, Diane and Alex from uh, Stanford, who are part of the Unified AI Fellowship and who did a lot of the work who's, uh, that uh, whose sl uh, slides, uh, you know, have kind of incorporated into this talk. Nick, who's a grad student at CMU, and um, my teammates at Unify ID, who have been very, very supportive of, uh, you know, the, especially some of the projects in here, uh, basically Sang and John, who's the CEO. So let's uh, dive right in. So the four horsemen that uh, I'll be kind of trying to emphasize on are data sets, models, the problem definitions that the community has kind of, uh, you know, somehow embraced as such uh, without uh, much forethought and questioning and aiding all of these the three horsemen is the fourth one which is the the sensationalist journalism um, and uh, so uh, uh, let's actually kind of go into the first section of the talk which is uh, dealing with the data sets we'll be kind of doing a, a, a deep dive into ImageNet and Celeb A uh, and trying to see uh, what uh, suboptimalities or ethical issues might have crept in uh, and how do we kind of go about addressing. And uh, like I said, um, at no point I would like to kind of, uh, uh, would like this talk to be construed as either some kind of an ad hominem insinuation towards either the creators or people who are involved at, with the projects. Uh, these, these are like, you know, magnificent pieces of work uh, that might have some issues and we as a community should kind of figure out ways to kind of address some of these. And this talk has to be seen in that spirit. 
so with regards to the ImageNet data set, uh, these are actually, uh, you, know, uh, you know, slides that I've taken from one of the best uh, uh, and most informative uh, talks in the, on this data set that was given by, in 2017, as part of an ACM webinar uh, by Professor Fei Fei Li. Uh, so before 2010, in the land of computer vision, you had uh, a bunch of data sets. Uh, as you can see uh, from 2003 to 2010, you see that the data sets are getting bigger and bigger. You have 9,000 images in Caltech 101, <clears throat> then Pascal VOC had 30K, the Sun data set had 131K, and then lo and behold, like ImageNet came onto the scene in 2009, 15 million images. And um, you know, when I kind of talk to uh, some of the inspiring figures in the field, most people think that the proverbial thawing of the AI winter, this was the moment. It was not. I mean, there's also the awesome result by uh, you know Jeffrey Hinton's group, the supervision team in 2012. But the the arrival of this data set, 15 million images. You were talking about like a few hundred thousand images till 2010. Uh, like with the Sun data set, you are talking now about like 15 million images, and this is considered one of those uh, you know like the Cambrian explosion moment uh, or something on those lines in the field of AI and deep learning specifically. Today, the data set is widely considered to be the holy grail uh, in computer vision. I don't think uh, I can kind of uh, have the audacity to submit anything to NeurIPS or ICML uh, claiming that this new architecture is going to be the, is, uh, I'm trying to pitch this new architecture to be the state of the art in computer vision unless I prove its metal on the ImageNet data set. And the main paper has been cited more than 11,000 times. And probably as we speak, maybe even it might have crossed the 12,000 barrier. Uh, and it has sparked, and this has been covered a lot in mainstream media. It's one of the most celebrated, uh, you know, achievements in vision. Um, 15 million images, that is like, uh, you know, that's massive. Uh, and uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, it also kind of ushered in uh, an entire ecosystem of startups. Um, and in fact, uh, if you kind of have a big achievement, if you build a big data set in any other domain, you, they say that, uh, oh, you are now on the cusp of the ImageNet moment for that domain. It's almost become like a, a word in the common lexicon um, uh, when the people are trying to kind of tout, uh, you know, how big their data set is. Um, and, uh, you know, it has 15 million images out of, uh, across uh, uh, 2000, uh, uh, two, uh, sorry, 21,841 uh, categories. Um, and uh, it was basically, uh, you know, uh, collected uh, initially uh, through, it was fueled in by web searches. And uh, then there was a hand verification process uh, that the Amazon Mechanical Turkers uh, that were, were basically recruited. And uh, in this slide, you can actually get to see, uh, you know, what the Amazon Mechanical Turkers saw when they were trying to annotate the data set. And uh, one issue that we saw here was that there was no explicit emphasis that was placed on, um, uh, you know, basically directing the Amazon Mechanical Turkers to uh, look for, uh, you know, NSFW images or images where the worker might have kind of, you know, probably flagged off if he felt that there was no, uh, you know, active consent that was given uh, by the subject inside of the image. Um, you know, and this, and in meanwhile, in the domain of, uh, you know, uh, the in the domain of ethics and uh, especially at the intersection of medical photography and ethics between 2003 and 2009 we see the this emergence of uh, a very interesting body of work uh, in fact the classic book on image ethics in the digital age was published in 2003 uh, and as you can see uh, if you if you basically go to google scholar search and if you set the filters to be between like 2000 and 2009 you'll see a plethora of publications coming in where they talk about like informed consent and uh, it's it's funny because a lot of the people who are like medical practitioners whose data sets are smaller are co constantly talking about the ethical ramifications of basically taking uh, you know these images and putting it out in public domain and there's this discourse that's kind of developing um, and uh, here I would like to kind of uh, point some uh, focus towards the brilliant work that's uh, that's done by Professor uh, Anastasia Powell, uh, she was at La Trobe University. Uh, she basically wrote uh, some of the seminal treatises on uh, configuring consent. What does it mean to kind of have explicit consent inside of a digital image? Many of you who are attending this talk might actually, you know, this might be very well your research careers and you might have more nuanced understandings about this. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you'll see like very interesting and very 
um, mature views as to what constitutes consent in a digital image that is going to be publicly shared kind of emerging and legislations, especially in so that in, in Australia, uh, you have a lot of legislations that are being passed at the state level but in this uh, time period as well. In fact, this very paper talks about uh, not just the legislations, but also the shortcomings of the legislations and how is it that in the uh, field of, uh, you know, voyeurism and stuff like that, uh, uh, like how do we kind of understand uh, what constitutes consent? Um, and uh, unfortunately, the mechanical Turkers uh, either did not raise enough flags or that there was no incorporation of the consent issue uh, into the data set. So what really did happen was that um, uh, a lot of non-consensual voyeuristic images uh, and verifiably pornographic, and this is where I think I need to classify a little bit, um, where um, when I say pornographic, you, the first question that I ask is like, oh, how do you know it is? Uh, and here, when I say verifiably pornographic, I meant images where you had the models and on the left-hand top corner, you could actually see the link uh, to the pay-per-view website, uh, which was a registered pornographic domain site. Uh, so these images, and then a lot of the images that were actually personal uh, images that uh, people were not very careful when they uh, shared on Flickr, and a lot of uh, you know new children's images kind of seeped into these uh, in, into this data set. Uh, the more notorious categories within the 1K data set were uh, class number 743, uh, prison, uh, 614, kimono, uh, 459, uh, which maps to brassiere, 450, 445, which is bikini and two piece, 433, which is bathing cap and swimming cap. So um, you have these uh, images kind of coming in uh, into these classes in the data set. Um, and I think we kind of missed uh, some of the uh, kind of, uh, you know, red flags in here because uh, in 2012, uh, you know, the, the contest happens, uh, you know, this image uh, net data set, uh, you know, it's, it's part of this, what is called as like uh, the, uh, the computer vision Olympics, if you will. Uh, so every year there's this contest that is held uh, as to who gets the highest uh, classification accuracy for the uh, uh, object detection problem. Uh, in 2012, uh, when you see the presentation that kind of announced uh, the winners, 2012 is considered to be an incredible moment in computer vision history because you had uh, Jeffrey Hinton's team, Supervision, uh, whose uh, architecture, that is Alex Snick architecture, absolutely you know, smashed the rest of the uh, field in terms of their accuracy. You can see in the plot on the left-hand side, the accuracy was about like, the top one accuracy was like 28, 26%. And then they went from that to 16%. And it's, it's in, in fact, that is called as the AlexNet moment in computer vision literature. And actually, if you see this, uh, the slides of this talk, uh, there's also this characterization of what categories were easy, what categories were hard. And then uh, it turns out like the toughest category uh, where most of the part, part spend, participating teams got uh, really poor accuracy was ladles. And uh, there you can actually see that when they kind of give uh, an example of the constellation of images that went into this category that is a ladle, so many of them have like, uh, you know, humans in this, and you actually even have like children um, I'm not trying to say that, uh, oh, look, I found something and this is itself unethical. I'm, I'm basically trying to say that, uh, you know, uh, in 2012, maybe we should have had these, these conversations. Um, and, you know, uh, feed for, uh, I mean, let's go to 2019 where, uh, you know, you had uh, the image roulette uh, project that came out of uh, New York University um, uh, by Kate Crawford and Trevor Paglin, uh, where people had to upload their images and it would kind of predict. Now the issue with this is that it kind of looks into the uh, the non one K part of the larger ImageNet dataset. So as we know, like ImageNet uh, dataset basically had uh, yeah, twenty one thousand eight forty one classes. One uh, K of those are basically used for the ImageNet one K uh, classification challenge, which most of the uh, you know researchers use. And in the other uh, twenty one thousand, there's also this people uh, note, and you know the a little bit of background. Uh, I'm pretty sure Professor Fefe will be able to kind of talk more about this. Uh, the, the hierarchy of images basically is mirroring that of WordNet um, coming in from the domain of linguistics. And there you have uh, a person uh, node and then I think excavating AI project kind of focused on that. So you would basically kind of upload an image and it would basically, uh, they would have a classifier trained on that corner of the image and data set and would predict what it was, uh, what the uh, model thought you were. And that basically had some kind of racial bias and a lot of noise was made about that. 
Um, and then I personally worked with Katya Nakwach, who's a, a, a reporter at um, Register, and we kind of uh, talked about uh, the emergence of these, uh, you know, the pornographic images and the drunken frat party images that had kind of seeped into the 1K section of the data set which most of the res researchers use. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was actually pretty cool that uh, in Fat Star Conference that just uh, finished in uh, last year in Barcelona, uh, you had this one, a really good paper uh, which was titled uh, Towards Fair Data Sets, Filtering and Balancing the Distribution of the People Subtree uh, in the Image Hierarchy, where they actually address this issue. And uh, this, is, this work is also a little bit of a masterpiece in terms of like, okay, you discovered that there was something wrong, like what is the most intellectually rigorous way to kind of go about a fix? Uh, and this is like an, a really good template. Uh, and then they basically do address the three problems of stagnant vocabulary, non-visual concepts, and lack of image diversity. And then uh, they actually uh, kind of uh, do uh, conclude that uh, out of the 2,832 existing sin sets, only 152 are like, uh, you know, plausibly safe to be used. Uh, and then they also do make a note in uh, passing that uh, within the 1K data set, they kind of consider these anthropocentric classes, if you will, which is bridegroom, ball player, and scuba diver, which they, uh, I think they rightfully concluded that these were uh, both imageable and safe. Uh, and uh, I think one of the things that they kind of missed out on was the fact that the, the threat kind of uh, lies elsewhere. It, it was actually in classes that I had kind of discussed before, like kimono, bikinis, and bathing suits, uh, uh, sorry, the brassier class, and so on and so forth. Um, so now the question is, what's the biggest threat now? Uh, the biggest threat now is that uh, right now, this data set is in the hands of thousands of uh, people all over the world, uh, if not more. Um, and uh, Right now, in these data sets, you have a lot of people uh, whose voyeuristic uh, pictures, whose upskirt pictures, uh, whose non-consensual pictures, uh, when their guards were down, were taken. And um, you know, as you might guys might have read about the New York Times expose on this company called Clearview, Clearview is basically not a problem. It's a symptom of a darker problem that uh, reverse image search is getting very, very strong of late. Uh, in fact, the susceptibility phase has just begun. Uh, there is this one uh, service, which is, I think, a Polish company named Pim Eyes. For $9.99, they'll be, basically give you access to their APIs. And uh, me and one reporter, we basically took some of the images from the ImageNet and we, uh, that we had kind of hand-tagged as dubious. Um, and then when we pass it through this image search, reverse image search, you could, the top results were basically, you know, telltale events of the fact that it was, we would very, could very easily figure out who they were in the real world. And uh, one of the reasons why we took a conscious decision not to kind of disseminate this information is because of exactly this, the strice and effect that you, your, your intention might be good, that you're basically trying to kind of highlight this issue. But then, um, you know, people who, who might not, who have these, you know, evil intentions might not even know about this and they might kind of jump on to, um, you know, or latch on to the fact that, oh, you can kind of automate the whole thing. And there might be like this cataclysmic blackmailing chain that might be ushered in. So now the question is like, uh, okay, what has to be done now? And I would also kind of uh, inform that it's not just the case that, uh, you know, at least uh, in our experience, we saw that this was not completely automatable. We had to kind of also munch together information coming in from the URLs, kind of pointing towards where the Flickr image actually originally came from that is still saved. And then we could kind of unearth who these people were in real life. Um, and then, uh, like I said, uh, if you're talking about these issues with ImageNet, ImageNet, uh, you know, the cool thing about ImageNet, it's open source and uh, there is this, a strong uh, commitment towards democratization that was kind of imbibed into the very birth of this project. Whereas the 800 pound gorilla in this domain is in fact the JFT 300M uh, data set. Uh, some of the most uh, cited works, recent cited works in computer vision uh, knowledge installation by uh, Hinton et al. Uh, the exception architecture, uh, which has been cited more than 2,300 times, uh, the seminal paper on revisiting unreasonable effectiveness, which kind of gives a template as to what should, be, how should the architectures evolve when you go from few million images to few hundred million images, should go deeper, should you go wider? So all of these are not very easily replicable because no one ha had access to this data set called JFT300M, which was Google's internal data set. They claim that they have 300 million web images and over 19,000 odd categories with uh, 375 million image label pairs. 
And uh, recently, uh, I think in the past few, like two months, uh, in, in the midst of this coronavirus uh, thing that's uh, unraveling, you had the, I saw two very interesting disseminations. One is the open images data set V4 and V6 that was just open sourced. Uh, and the big transfer paper that came out of Google Brain as well. Um, and this is basically like data sets built uh, more like, you know, like, like the cleaner versions of the JFT300M data set. And I would like you guys to just Google about this and see the images there in similar categories. Um, uh, it, I mean, uh, you have so many images uh, and this is not like the fact that, oh, I found like some pornographic images. To me, the more issue, the bigger issue is that of children, um, like basically naked children at the beaches. Um, and we have in fact reached out to, uh, in fact, it has links to the active Flickr accounts. And when we reached out to the grandparents and the parents who took the pictures and who basically put it on Flickr, um, unbeknownst to them, they, they had erroneously said they're sharing uh, permission to be CCBY. And that basically kind of allowed Google uh, to basically kind of take all of these images and basically build this data set. There are surely some ethical ramifications of this and hopefully this community will kind of rally together and kind of address this issue. Uh, and this is, like I said, besides ImageNet and GFT uh, 300M, you have another dimension of uh, kind of ethical malaise, if you will. That's the other big data set, which is Celeb A data set. Celeb A data set was born in, uh, by uh, uh, the authors in Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, it basically, and then there are different variants of this uh, Celeb A data set, Celeb A HQ, Celeb A mask HQ, and which are like the high quality, higher uh, pixel version of this uh, particular data set. Uh, in Celebrate data set, you have 200,000 images belonging to 10,000 odd celebrities from all over the world. There are five uh, landmark uh, locations in the face, and this is how a typical image looks like. And then associated with each of these images are basically 40 binary attributes. And you have attributes such as like attractive, which is a binary attribute, by the way. Uh, like, is this person in the picture physically attractive or not? Um, and then you have things like chubby and pale skin. And when, I, when you kind of raise this issue, the standard uh, response you get is basically that of an eye roll, like, oh, come on, what is so wrong about that? And we'll kind of see uh, what, what possible downstream effects can these attributes have when you kind of uh, ingest these data sets into some statistical models. Um, and if you were to kind of summarize this data set, we took, uh, you know, the Gaia model that was uh, basically published by Sandberg et al. Um, and we tried to get this attribute wise uh, image visualization going as to what, how would this images look like if I collect all of the attractive images and kind of look at the centroid of the convex hull of the images. And as you can see on the right hand side, that is how the prototypical attractive image looks like and how this is, and the bottom one is how the prototypical big nose image looks like and you I leave the interpretation of these images to the community here um, the celeb a HQ is also another interesting meta artifact that came out of celeb a because in order to kind of build these very realistic looking images you still need this data set and what has really happened is that instead of these uh, la these organizations kind of collecting uh, you know indulging in this very expensive procedure of collecting their own data sets they had very smartly kind of layered it on top of Celeb A, where they took the Celeb A data set and they built a high quality version of that uh, data set with uh, 1024 by 1024 resolution because the Celeb A data set basically has really tiny images from size 43 by 55 to really big ones like 67, 32 by 89, 84 pixels. And they kind of standardized it, they cleaned it. Uh, they did a whole bunch of signal processing to make it look high quality. And even though this uh, the procedure does appear in the appendix C of the paper in on archive, there is no script, at least to the best of my opinion, I'd be happy to be proven wrong as to how to how did they actually what is the source code that they used to uh, basically uh, kind of take the raw images from Celebe and convert that into Celebe HQ. And uh, the improved quality of this synthetic data set, this kind of meta synthetic data set that they have, does have ramifications in terms of like how good quality the images look like when you kind of throw it into generative models. Um, and like I said, the other culprits include, uh, you know, there are data sets like SCUT uh, FPP. FPP is, by the way, an oft used, um, you know, acronym in computer vision, which stands for fa uh, facial beauty prediction which a lot of my uh, colleagues in ethics kind of really cringe and wonder as to why is it that this is being allowed to be used uh, even. And this data set has kind of spurred a lot of uh, papers in the past two years um, and where they basically have categorization as to how attractive the person is. And this, in this image, you can go from uh, the attractiveness apparently goes from right to left. 
Um, and it's, it's uh, when you kind of show this, uh, these data sets for people in humanities and in ethics, it, they, it, it's actually quite a fun thing to kind of look at the, the initial reaction on their faces. Um, and if you guys are more interested in the surveillance aspect, which is another vector of uh, you know, ethical malice when it comes to vision data sets, um, I would like to kind of draw attention towards this one of the most incredible pieces of tech journalism where it's all of the uh, the D3JS and JavaScript magic meets uh, data visualization meets, um, you know, expose, if you will. Uh, and this project is the megapixels.cc project. Uh, you can kind of click on what happened this, with this data set, who used it, what led, uh, what triggered the authors to eventually delete the data set from the internet, but how many people might actually have this, uh, or is it too late and stuff like that. Uh, so you had the famous MS uh, Celeb 1 million data set that you guys might know of. Uh, there are other ones as well. In fact, uh, I think I might be in one of these data sets because I used to uh, visit the Brainwash Cafe in San Francisco in that period where this uh, uh, data set was collected very often. Uh, it was one of my favorite jobs when I used to live in the city. Um, and I can't even verify because the data set has been deleted. Um, and yeah, this is basically what I was kind of referring to. The odds that I'm in this data set is actually kind of pretty high. And it was like one of those moments which kind of made me think like, oh, how many data sets am I part of that I don't even know? Uh, and in this case, I think uh, the trigger point was the fact that uh, 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 these guys uh, worked with journalists and they wrote this article about how it is used with National University of Defense Technology in China. And then that is, I think, I think, and I, this is kind of what uh, the people at Megapixel also think that this is one of those moments which basically led to the uh, you know deletion of the data set. Um, so it's not just the data sets. The, the second horseman that we'll be talking about is the models, especially the, with the focus being on generative models. So 2018 to 2020, we have seen the coming of age of deep generative models of Hall Hughes, uh, belonging to three main uh, categories. If you look at the menagerie of generative models, which are the state of the art today, you have three families. You have the, the GAN family, and then you have the VA, the variation auto encoder family, and then you have the flow-based models. Um, and uh, you know, all of these have been basically built, they, they're kind of data hungry. They have been built on these, what I believe are like, you know, questionable and dubious data sets. Uh, you might have actually chance upon this, uh, you know, website, which, is, which went viral some time back called this person does not exist.com. The two images that you see in this uh, slide, they are they, these creepily human looking images actually do not belong to uh, uh, any human being. If these were generated by a GAN, um, and all of these, uh, you know, generative models kind of tout that they have this awesome thing, which is basically uh, that these uh, generative models allow for latent uh, space representation or latent space um, uh, interpolation. So what this means is that you can take an image and basically encode it as a numerical vector in some semantic space. Uh, the neighbors of these images will be uh, having characteristics like frown and smile, as you can see in the right-hand side of the page, um, of the slide rather. And uh, now the question is like, okay, why is this so wrong? So technically what you can do with the celebrity data set that we have is that you can collect all of the attractive images uh, and you can see where they kind of lie in the uh, latent semantic space. And you can take all of the non-attractive images and you see where they lie in the semantic space and basically uh, take the difference vector. And that is basically the attractiveness activation vector. So what this literally means is that I can take a, your picture, I can encode it into the latent space, and I can drag it on along the direction of that attractive vector to see how uh, the attractiveness kind of evolves. So what happens is that you take Obama's picture, and then you try to drag it along the attractiveness direction, and this is what happens. You can see this in the top row, and this is what happens in the bottom row with Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, you'll see where this kind of is heading towards. And this kind of, it, this is not really surprising because we already saw how the prototypical images kind of look like in Celebay images as to, that were kind of tagged to be attractive. Uh, we kind of replicated this across a whole bunch of celebrities. And this is not like a race specific issue. Uh, you will see that uh, eventually all of the uh, attractive faces kind of emerge, uh, kind of end up in this little sub manifold of what is deemed to be attractive. Uh, which is fueled by the, you know, the tags that were associated with these images, uh, the raw images that is in the celebrity data set based on which these models were trained. Uh, and oftentimes uh, they say that, oh, it's not the model, the bias is in the data. And we kind of disagree, and this is why, and this is where I think I would also like to kind of, uh, you know, thank uh, some of my Stanford colleagues who actually worked on with me in this specific project. What we found is that these 40 different binary attributes 
uh, when it's expressed over these 40,000 images in a CELEB-A HQ or uh, over 200,000 images in CELEB-A, they basically have uh, strong correlations between them. Um, so uh, we can use tools from uh, you know, statistical physics like Ising models, uh, or basically you can kind of uh, draw out a probabilistic graphical model prior over these binary attributes. And you'll get to see like a very kind of saddening figure emerge that you know um, some of them are like very intuitive, like mustache being associated with males is reasonable, attractive being associated with paleness is probably not. Um, so we basically did this thought experiment, okay? We will basically build a statistical prior of all of these attributes that were kind of ignored when you ba basically build that, uh, you know, your gender model, you ignored the uh, inter attribute correlations, and then you just focus on the pixel space data. And then after this, you're kind of in, you're bringing in the attribute in the a posteriori sense. So just because something was correlated in the attribute domain, does it mean that it was also uh, implicitly correlated in the latent space domain? And we found that yes, in fact, uh, they were, in fact, uh, there was a very strong correlation with a p-value of 8.5 e minus 42, uh, 47. Uh, and uh, what this really means is that uh, I can technically use a very simple stock gap solution where I can kind of uh, disentangle the influence of the, uh, you know, the spurious correlations of the priors from the attribute space. And if I, I can basically kind of reverse the effect of the Markov blanket chain, and this should kind of uh, help the model kind of cure up better. And this also kind of points to the fact that it was not just in the data set, but also in the modeling process that you willfully ignored the prior of the attributes. And hence, there's part of the brain that the modeling part can also kind of, you know, take upon itself. And this is what happens, um, you know, uh, on the top row is how the state of the art currently looks like uh, with this regard, with this specific generative model that uh, uh, we used. We would not like to kind of launch an ad hominem attack against this specific model. That's not our goal. We saw this repeat across all of the different flavors of GAN and uh, flow-based architectures. And then uh, you will see that the top row is basically how the state of the art looks. And the bottom is one when you kind of do this kind of disentangling of these, uh, you know, the Marco blanket neighbors, uh, which is not like the optimal thing, but we, our goal was to showcase the fact that yes, there is part of the blame that the model also deserves because of the fact that they ignored the attribute space correlations. Um, and then this is basically further proof of the fact that like on the top row is how the state of the art looks like. And the bottom row is basically after our corrections. Um, and it's not just the case that, you know, there were these, there was this one idiosyncratic thing where they just uh, let the prevalence of the attractiveness binary factor somehow percolate through the years. If you look at uh, some of the state of the art papers, uh, you know, coming in from the biggest of the research labs, one trick that everyone uses these days to train GANs, uh, if you have literally kind of written any bit of computer vision code uh, to train GANs, one standard trick that everyone uses is to kind of, um, you know, weaken the discriminator um, so that it doesn't become uh, disproportionately powerful very early in the epoch. So that trick is called as the crippled discriminator trick. And this is, as you can see, uh, people who are working outside of the domain, this is a very, very ableist nomenclature. And this is where I would also like to emphasize that uh, it's not the case that I'm kind of pretending to be this, uh, I'm, I'm sitting on this high horse and trying to say that I'm the one who's woke here and, uh, you know, I'm not culpable. Uh, when we submitted this to, uh, you know, uh, FAT workshop, uh, and we, we basically kind of uh, said that our work basically addresses this prior blindness problem this was one of the most beautifully authored uh, rejection emails that I've ever gotten in my entire little academic career, uh, where they basically uh, said, you know, kind of went through in detail as to what was the uh, issue behind using the term prior blindness, how unbeknownst to me, this is a very strongly ableist, you know, terminology to use and how you put yourself in the uh, shoes of a blind person who might be, you know, kind of reading your paper and what would be the ramifications of that. And it's not just that recently for uh, in the upcoming ICLR workshop, um, you know, we submitted our paper on afro MNIST where we try to kind of democratize, uh, you know, MNIST data sets across different other numeral glyph systems in Africa, specific, specifically like the GIS, Y, ENCO, and Ospania languages. And we had uh, used the term manpower and we, we, and the reviewers did point us out that look, you know, there is a clear, we, you have to kind of come up with a better gender neutral uh, replacement thing. So the point is like, I am, uh, like I said, these are clips notes from the belly of the beast. I have been culpable myself. Uh, and I, you know, it's still a work in progress. And I think we will certainly need stronger participation from the humanities and the ethics, uh, 
components of human intellectual endeavor to kind of guide us uh, in, 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 in this larger endeavor. Um, and last but not the least, we have the issue of problem definitions. Uh, I sometimes wonder, and this is kind of my personal uh, issue, and you guys can give me a reality check or an attitude correction if I think that there's nothing wrong with these problems being solved. Things like, if you, I routinely see papers on gender swapping, ethnicity classification, speech to face, face to speech, uh, attractiveness scoring, beautification, criminality detection using images. Um, you know, the, the bio communities were kind of very interesting because they have kind of uh, come to the understanding that there should be a ban on human genome editing because of ethical issues. So, uh, you know, some of the examples that I would like to go through very quickly are like gender swapping. This paper came out like last month and I've shared the, uh, the images that I have kind of shared to the community on, with the Google Drive link. Maybe it's going to be taken down in the coming days. What really did happen was when uh, they implemented this technology on uh, as a Snapchat filter, basically there was, you, you can kind of go through the article yourself, men kind of uh, try to do this when they gender swap to in, into the female semantic space, if you will, and they tried to kind of fish, uh, to kind of carry out like phishing attacks on, uh, on dating websites and stuff like that. Should we really be working on this problem uh, at all? Um, and you can see some of the images that they have shared in that paper. And by the way, these images are of kids who have been gender swapped. Uh, so they are actually male kids who are now become, uh, who have been projected into the female space and vice versa. And there is absolutely no ethical ramification being considered when you publish these papers. You have problems on ethnicity classification, the most notorious one that appeared in 2016 uh, during the proceedings of the Chinese conference on, on biometric recognition talked about basically uh, ethnicity classification based on facial images of Han, Uyghur, and non-Chinese. Um, I'm, uh, I, I don't know if there's actually a linkage between this and what's unraveled in certain parts of the country and um, you know, and it's not the only paper like uh, in ECCV, which is one of the top ranked conferences in computer vision, you have this very interesting paper that I saw, which said that, oh, you know, in ethnicity classification, there's this uh, racial bias, we will basically use uh, some techniques to basically fix the racial bias in ethnicity classification. The irony was like so thick and it was like kind of unbelievable. Uh, and you find so many papers on attractiveness scoring and lest we forget, you know, this is not com uh, coming from, uh, you know, outside of US, you, you look at the participating institutions in San Diego, West Virginia University, um, where they rank uh, these images based on how attractive the face is. Uh, the scores are getting very granular before it used to be categorical. Now you have like floating point numbers associated with the face uh, and they're getting bigger. The data sets are getting bigger by the day. Um, I don't know what uh, recluse the people who have been automatically uh, categorized. I don't know if they actually ever gave consent of the, about the fact that their face would be categorized as attractiveness one when their images went into this data set. Um, you have, uh, again, top tier conference like ICASP, which is one of the uh, top ranked uh, conferences in signal processing, uh, basically publishing papers like improving a facial attractiveness prediction via co-attention learning. Um, and, you know, the, uh, there's a part of me which is like devil's advocate, which talks about like real life mirroring. Are we really, is this really unethical or does it really just uh, mirror what's happening in real life? Because there was this very interesting interview by one of those dating websites uh, or the dating app uh, CEOs. And he was like being brutally honest as to why, how is it that people actually swipe top, bottom, left, right, whatever it is, uh, to basically, and, and they, he's talking about their preferences and they said that it's mostly image at attractiveness based and um, I'm just kind of leaving this out for, uh, for the discussion. You have papers on criminality classification using GATE. Recently a paper came out of uh, University of North Carolina where they predict, they say that they can predict if a person has deceptive intent or basically, basically looking at their GATE images. Uh, you have criminality classification using faces. And this is actually one of the most fascinating papers that I've read because the, the authors published it. Um, and then um, they also kind of published uh, and, there was, and this kind of went viral in, especially in the Western media outlets uh, with what I believe has, uh, uh, it, it, no one seems to be addressing it, is this growing sense of sinophobic connotations when you have these conversations, just beyond unfair. But then one was very interesting is that the authors say that this actually maps to the Chinese folklore term of Mian Jiang Shu. And I, I'm hoping that some of you are more learned about this. It's very interesting to kind of see that it's not just the case that, you know, what is ethical for me is not, might not be uh, ethical or unethical to other person coming from another culture. And they basically talk about the fact that they reject the idea that this paper kind of promulgates scientific racism or 
uh, eugenics or uh, physiognomy because they said that uh, they kind of corrected for all of those things and they were able to see even then strong correlations emerge. Um, there was another paper that appeared recently called Voice to Speech, which claims that you can kind of, if you give me an image, I can kind of predict how the person sounds like in real life. Uh, and it's very interesting when you kind of look into what kind of motivated this work, uh, you know, the, I, I, one of my uh, Chinese interns kind of pointed towards the fact that there is actually a lot of videos which talk about this. It's a very fascinating body of work where they talk about like clues in your facial structure as to how it might map to some of the idiosyncrasies in, in your personal, um, you know, characteristics. And there's like this kind of a cultural prior where they, there's this inherent belief uh, existent in certain uh, maybe subcultures that there might be certain clues and this is kind of motivating and this kind of percolating this it's not like the ai researchers kind of just thought about it being uh wanting to be sinister but they were trying to uh you know carry out these hypothesis tests within the domain of ai and if you look at the japanese paper that i just referred to they actually say that the motivation actually came from this uh from this body of work in evolutionary psychology where they talk about like the human brain actually kind of does this very interesting amalgamation of clues coming in from the uh, the speech and the vision component to kind of build the, uh, you know, the the model of the person as such. And the the, the, the motivation for them to carry, on, carry out this work was not to showcase the fact that, look, you can do this, but it actually came from evolutionary psychology. So maybe it's time for evolutionary psychologists and maybe all of these uh, interesting meta body of literature to kind of put out a problem, kind of a statement of sort saying that, look, if you're going to be co-opting my work uh, within your little AI and deep learning frameworks, these, this is what I mean, this is not what you should be doing. And uh, it, I think a lot of these papers do have motivations that actually come from, uh, you know, like uh, psychology and neuroscience, which is with, like very fascinating to uh, kind of see. And like I said, before we jump onto the, uh, what is really a sordid saga of like xenophobic bandwagon, the people jumping on the speech to face paper um, that went viral on a lot of media outlets that I'll be addressing soon, came out of MIT. Uh, the faces to faces from voices paper that created a lot of ruckus in this year's New Europe's, sorry, uh, last year's New Europe's, uh, in Vancouver, uh, came out of CMU, my alma mater. Um, and, uh, the relative ranking of facial attractiveness paper came out of UC San Diego and the deceptive walk paper came out of university of North Carolina. So you tell me, uh, where is this narrative coming from that it's actually, you know, people belonging to one nation state with compromised ethics that is basically kind of producing this body of literature. That is, that is, it's at least in my very humble opinion, just a false statement. Um, and like I said, uh, kind of. Uh, aiding all of these things, uh, all of these malices is uh, sensationalist journalism, not very helpful. Uh, I'm certainly not finger pointing towards all of them. Uh, like I personally worked with uh, several reporters, uh, including Katiana at Register, and uh, I have seen strong uh, sense of iconoclasm and irreverence, which should be obligatory to the members of the fourth estate. Uh, so you had one example last year where uh, there was this Wired article where they claimed that Stitch Fix is using something called eigenvector decomposition, a concept from quantum physics. Let that kind of seep in for a moment, like using something called eigenvector decomposition, a con concept from quantum physics to tease apart the overlapping nodes in an individual style. Although full credit, they did have a correction that they published after uh, you know they became kind of explored on Twitter and stuff like that, where they said in an earlier version of this uh, article inaccurately described uh, an, an eigenvector decomposition. It's a concept from linear algebra, not from quantum physics. Um, and uh, remember all of those speech-to-face uh, papers that I talked about. Yeah, l l how were they treated when it hit the mainstream media? Look at the titles: uh, How to catch a criminal using only milliseconds of audio. We all know when uh, you know who is going to be disproportionately influenced uh, or uh, you know affected by this. In the AI era, your voice could give away your face. AI listened to people's faces, then it uh, people's voices, then it generated their faces. MIT's deep neural network reconstructs faces using only voice audio. I do agree that uh, if you actually go through the papers, the authors do kind of make a kind of a footnote reference to the fact that, hey, look, we are kind of showing that this is possible. We are, we are not trying to say this is ethical thing to do. I have to give them full credit. I'm not trying to, like I said, uh, which is why I've kind of removed all of the author names, um, that, that many of these papers, if not all, do mention that there are certain ethical ramifications of this. But then when it hits mainstream media, look at the titles and the narrative that is kind of constructed. Uh, it's a little bit of like Chinese whispers happening, um, but then uh, when you want to kind of, uh, when it kind of gets projected into the world of clickbait, 
the story is actually like uh, completely different and tainted. Um, the opening eyes glow model uh, based on which some of the earlier work I showed in terms of like disentangling the influence of the binary attributes. It was kind of, uh, you know, it went viral. I don't know how many um, medium articles uh, and blogs were published. Uh, the GAN paper that was built on the CELEB A data, CELEB A HQ data set basically had like very flowery, uh, you know, glowing headlines thrown at it. Um, and there's also this kind of recurring theme of this AI has learned. I think it's like the the easiest clickbait to kind of snare in more, uh, you know, eyeballs into your website. AI has learned how to predict your IQ from brain scans. This AI has learned how to play death metal music and we can't stop headbanging to it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, this is a time where, uh, and, and uh, lest we forget that, uh, I would like to draw attention towards uh, this amazing project being uh, carried out by Lucy Lin uh, at UNC of Washington under Noah Smith's group. Uh, they basically ha are kind of collecting uh, what they hope will be like the image net of the sensationalism that's happening within the larger domain of science. If you find uh, that you feel that there's some article which is very cringeworthy, which is misrepresenting a piece of uh, research that was done with all of these clickbait uh, titles, uh, please, please, please take some time to kind of log into this uh, portal and please make your contribution so that there can be, uh, we can build maybe detectors and basically put a caveat or like a Chrome extension saying that, hey, look, uh, this might, this has a very high probability of uh, it being like uh, one of those sensationalized uh, hyped up news bits. Um, uh, you know, there are some similar uh, plugins available for this text might be generated by a GPT-2 model or a BERT model. This was, this was not even human generated. So it's nice to uh, kind of empower people who are actually looking at this uh, with intellectual rigor to kind of ensure that we are kind of contributing our might towards solving this problem. So to conclude, um, you know, we basically had, we talked about like the tainted big data sets which are being distilled into these bias enhancing and uh, bias propagating uh, models. Uh, and there's this kind of sense of, uh, oh, it's not me, it's a data set kind of uh, uh, recurring theme that is um, being kind of promulgated by some, if not many of the authors who are coming up with these models. And uh, these works are being celebrated in the, the best of the very best conferences uh, that we clearly saw in, in, in the a few examples. And then you have the meeting of the ill-conceived problem definitions uh, that are just admittedly, you know, kind of accepted without any moral recluse. And all of this is kind of being amplified by the sensationalist media, uh, which is not helping things either. Uh, so to conclude with, uh, I do have certain, uh, you know, like maybe talking points, maybe questions to the policy wonks here and the ethicists and the lawyers maybe. Uh, I don't know if uh, sometimes when I'm kind of looking at uh, some of these images and kind of hand tagging them, I don't even know if it's legal to do even that. Uh, and is it uh, uh, illegal or is it ethical to inform these victims who are in these data sets preemptively? Uh, is it legal to even possess these data sets? I know that there are several parts of the world where it's illegal to, for you to possess pornography on your computer. If I have this data set, does that kind of, uh, you know, implicitly mean that I'm kind of culpable under those legislations? Is there a framework to create a blacklist of problem statements where the editors of these top tier journals will say, look, man, like you're, you're basically, I know that your architecture is fancy and you have thrown in, uh, you know, a few billion more parameters and you use the fanciest of, uh, you know, momentum tricks and, uh, uh, you know, your discriminator coupling to kind of fine tune your model on 10 million GPUs. Um, but this, you're trying to solve the problem of uh, ethnicity classification. This is, uh, you know, not okay. And we will certainly not accept papers. So is it, is there a framework to kind of generate these blacklists of problem statements? Uh, and also can we, uh, and three other meta points uh, uh, that I want to discuss um, and feel free to comment on this. There is a growing sense of, uh, you know, body of literature on backdoor attacks during training. There are all, all, all of these auto ML services that are becoming popular. None of them are giving guarantees that when you give them their data and the model that they give is not, uh, they didn't not bake in data poisoning driven uh, backdoor attacks during training time. Is it uh, okay? Is, is it legal for us to demand that auto ML services give those guarantees? Uh, Rome Call for AI Ethics is a very interesting document that I would like to kind of draw some attention towards. Please do read it they make this point that uh, you know, there has to be an interaction awareness guarantee that when people are kind of interacting with AI, they should know that they're actually interacting with a machine learning model and not a human being. This kind of goes absolutely counter to this uh, growing sense of seamlessness or frictionless experience that all of the companies are doubting. And there's also these legislations being passed on right to repair, uh, you know, and targeting companies like Apple and Tesla. Now, 
uh, you have all of these technologies being learned with machine learning models and AI, how does how can right to repair and right to customize coexist with these uh, AI driven technologies where the ethical ramifications of you meddling with something downstream can be profoundly you know stark. So with that, I would like to kind of uh, uh, you know invite uh, the questions uh, or who is going to be taking the the next uh, step here. Okay, thank you so much, Vinay. Um, really covered a lot of ground there and raised some really interesting issues. Um, so to start off our uh, Q&A session here, um, I'd like to introduce our co-director of the Human Centered AI Institute, Dr. Fei Fei Li. Uh, she's the inaugural Sequoia Professor in the Computer Science Department here at Stanford. Um, and has served as director of Stanford uh, AI Lab uh, from 2013 to 2018, and um, an, amongst a number of other uh, amazing positions. So we're really glad to have her here uh, to start off the Q&A uh, on Vinay's talk. Thanks so much, Doctor. Thank you, thank you, Colin, and thank you, Vinay. I'm I'm just very humbled by your talk and wearing the hat of a normal computer vision researcher. Uh, it's quite a tour de force. Uh, you know, I've never, I, I don't recall being at a talk within 45 minutes, we touched on the so many issues of computer vision technology. I was just listing what you have uh, touched upon from, you know, privacy to offensive content, uh, to bias, to uh, disinformation, to um, uh, race, criminology, and ethical ramification to cultural sensitivities to uh, journalistic sensationalism so really congrats on uh, on uh, touching on all this uh, all these topics and as a computer vision researcher I have to say it's very humbling to to listen to this because um, 20 years ago exactly 20 years ago I was a um, first year PhD student in the field of computer vision and I remember the very first paper my advisor gave me to read about is a face recognition paper uh, touted as it really uh, the Viola Jones paper as a breakthrough in computer vision technology but at that time no one cared about computer vision technology and I would have not imagined the social impact that this field has in a short two decades. So uh, just as a quick question, so I don't want to take audience time. It's, um, it's actually, um, you know, I was just thinking about the history of making ImageNet yeah. and realizing all the potential issues. And of course I was very proud we, we wrote this uh, following follow-up paper last year to yes. remedy some of the issues. But uh, how do we balance the um, desire to do cutting edge research. A lot of my students are looking at cutting edge research. Uh, for example, we're working with doctors to try to help uh, seniors live a better uh, uh, aging life. And then we wanna use computer vision technology to help uh, doctors to find out uh, the, the kind of clinically re relevant uh, behavioral uh, patterns that that might have a clinical outcome and this process is deeply ethical right like we have to collect data whose data do we collect we have to annotate data we have to annotate human behaviors and then we have to deploy models yeah. so do you have any um, advice or, or or just insight on for an eager passionate computer vision young researcher embarking on cutting edge technology like this, how do we balance that uh, technical approach or, and, and, and eagerness uh, with all these ethical ramifications and also things we might not even think of in yeah. the um, future? Right. Uh, yeah, to begin with, yeah, thank you so much. It's so humbling to hear these words. And I think I stated in our uh, personal conversation as well, I can only be labeled to be like a fanboy of yours. You have been a very inspirational presence in the community. Uh, for like, oh my gosh, for the longest time ever, I I recall reading your papers as an undergrad, and uh, yeah, it's uh, very humbling to hear those words from you. Thank you that, so that, much. That speaks of our age difference. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, uh, 
so when it comes to generative models, uh, this is the feedback that I got uh, was that uh, there is a, a, if you look at anthropology departments, uh, there is this growing belief that uh, there's a very interesting body of work that computer vision completely ignores is that uh, human face itself has evolved with two forces being impinged on it. One has got to do with the fact that uh, your face uh, basically wants to, humans are kind of uh, unique in amongst the primates that our faces look starkly different uh, compared to the other. And that's because of the fact that there is this plumage uh, narrative that is sold that is we, our face genetically wants to look different, but then there's a constricting negative prior coming in from genetics. Like uh, we want to be kind of look a little bit like our parents. So there is this very interesting body of work that's happened in Berkeley, which was actually also exhib exhibited at the California Academy of Sciences where they believe that uh, you can actually model what happened to the human face and its evolution purely through uh, you know, yeah, your evolutionary tracking. They believe that you can kind of begin with certain seed images and then you look at the evolutionary forces that are impinging on the face manifold and then you can kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, pay heed to that. So they were kind of literally saying this, that in vision, what you do is you take millions of images without consent from all of the world, and you try to build these statistical models and see if they kind of extrapolate. But why not look at the more mathematically, uh, you know, uh, sounded, uh, grounded works coming in from anthropology, where they have looked at the same question as to how is it that human faces kind of look very different? And how do I kind of come up with a generative uh, model for like, you know, the human face generation? I think that's one, um, Thing, feedback that I have gotten. Uh, the other one was I'm very, very passionate about uh, synthetic to real. Um, uh, like, you know, basically learn in the synthetic domain. Uh, reinforcement learning people are like, they've done amazing work. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, can we basically, uh, you know, you can, uh, can, can we train models on, um, you know, like synthetic imagery coming in from uh, the world of animation and so on and so forth. Uh, and computer graphics and basically train our models. Uh, we, I saw like three papers where they uh, trained the models entirely on hand, hand uh, uh, you know, written uh, uh, sketches. In fact, there is a, 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 a version of your image in a data set called the Sketch Image Net that came out of CMU. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I did was I basically took this very interesting project called uh, Anime Fire, where, I, where you, what you do is you take all of the sketches and you basically project it into the colorized space by passing it through the animifying model. And then uh, what I saw was some of the models actually were able to get very, very high accuracy. So I personally find that uh, if only our community could basically emphasize on the harder problems, which is basically synthetic to real, train on synthetic data and test on real world data, uh, I think uh, that has a, a lot of uh, potential as well. But uh, like I said, uh, um, you know, uh, this, this is the feedback that I've gotten when I've kind of talked to uh, what the solutions might be. And uh, I would like to kind of put that in a very humble setting there. So I, I do want to just pass this whole question, yeah. uh, QA session to the rest of the audience. I, I want to just share with you one piece of information. Yes. This is an ongoing work in progress by yeah. Stanford uh, HAI, which yeah. probably is first time shared with you and the rest of the community here online is that we are taking the ethics uh, uh, in, in, impact implication of our work very seriously. We are now under the leadership of three professors, Professor Michael Bernstein, Professor Deborah Satz, and Professor Margaret Levy, experimenting a ethics uh, review process of HAI funded grants a little bit uh, modeled after and inspired by the human subject review process, which is called IRB, that nationwide uh, or worldwide, yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of universities uh, do. Now we are uh, starting to experiment our ERB, ethics review uh, board uh, process. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very early work in progress. We wanna report back when we're ready, but uh, um, works like yours and many others inspire us to, to think about um, how to do AI in a more yeah. uh, greater context. So thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, one point I would like to also make is uh, when we contacted uh, some of the, so it turns out like, especially in the Google's latest data set, um, three of my friends are in the data set. And it was uh, when I asked them, they have they have the consent, they have given the consent to be in the data set as well because they said I put it out uh, with CC BY license on Flickr. So I think there's also like this cost angle 
data is actually not cheap and it should not be cheap it's basically human existence human body which is being kind of you know people i think there's a very large market of people who want to kind of give the their contribute their data and i think it also has to do with the fact that uh, uh, right now the all of the remuneration and the uh, the money is being spent on very high salaries for researchers and ceos but if we were to kind of calibrate that and actually data collection is expensive and so it should be you're literally taking human experience and i think it all, it is also an uh, issue of economics of scale um it, uh, faces uh, i'm pretty sure a lot of people would uh, kind of i've seen some uh, solutions being proposed in terms of like face coin and stuff like that uh, like in the crypto currency space i'm not trying to advocate any of that but people say that at inherently at the heart of this is not so much just about ethics it's also the cost of like siphoning images without consent and the frustration comes not because of the fact that loss of privacy but also loss of income like okay i'm willing to give my face but if i'm getting a fair amount of money out of which is why models exist right so uh, i think it's uh, the cost uh, because if you see what is the amount of uh, you know the economy that has been generated purely on the basis of the amazing thing that is the imagination data set i'm pretty sure uh, you have you have kind of sparked off an economy of more than like billions of dollars of worth of you know economic activity and i think at the heart of it uh, it it might be the case that uh, you know some of them would would have actually have to go to the people whose faces were in the data set or uh, you know uh, there has to be a participation an end to end participation or cyclical participation of the uh, volunteers who gave their data um, and it's also like an economic angle and i think active consent is the key thing here as long as you have an active consent given by uh, the end uh, you know data uh, volunteer i think uh, it it's on reasonably ethical sound grounds thank you back to you colin okay thank you so much dr lee i really appreciate that and um i will um turn it over to the crowd here uh, after I, I ask one thing um, of my own Vinay really enjoyed the talk and um, wondered if um, if the title was really accurate uh, because you know you call it ethical malice but when yeah. you described um, your reactions you've got when you uh, raise some of these issues in the community it sounded like more like a kind of indifference to the ethical issues um, but on the other hand you've also mentioned you know you're able to disentangle spurious correlations and latent space to avoid unintended consequences uh, it sounds like there's a problem here that might have some social solutions and some technical solutions as, as well and um, yeah. so kind of building off some of Feifei's questions um, what do you what what do you see going forward here? Here. Um, does the what might the community uh, consider as far as technical and kind of um, social uh, changes? Um, the specific ones that can be actually implemented and implemented rather quickly by just a handful of people um, is that uh, you know basically coming up with like uh, a zero tolerance policy for at least like all of the journals and conferences uh, that really matter. um and basically say, trying to say that here is a list of problem statements if you are going to be working on this then uh you know uh, we will not be accepting uh these papers i i'm not trying to say that i have the uh, uh the intellectual capacity to say that this is the list but maybe we, the community can vote on it maybe the sss can kind of pitch in here and kind of guide the way through but i think there is one very easy uh, doable data set Uh, sorry doable uh, uh you know point uh, that has like uh, that can be actually achieved within a shorter short uh, uh, you know time frame uh, pe people in other domains have actually done this like i don't think i can write a paper on human cloning and submit it to nature can i so uh, we can kind of uh, bank off of the experience of other fields especially in life sciences who have already done this before and come up with this kind of no no list if you will um the other issue is uh, the other thing that we can actually certainly do is uh, maybe start putting caveats um saying that look yeah i mean uh, i did kind of train this model on this data set but uh, if you are reading this uh, please be aware of the fact that uh, you know there have been these issue that have 
issues that have been pre-highlighted about this data set um, so that the, you know, this will kind of create uh, a momentum in itself. And the last thing is, uh, you know, the undergraduate community that's in schools right now, this is the time, uh, you know, um, deep learning is exploding. It's becoming incredibly democratized. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's not just the undergraduates, but also like these uh, uh, MOOCs. Uh, basically, I think I would, I would like to make certain ethics courses mandatory. And in fact, uh, you know, make it so, uh, make it rigorous and uh, also ensure that you will not be awarded the certification of completing that course unless you pass this reasonably rigorous ethics examination. Um, and then uh, I think uh, NSF can also kind of, uh, you know, come in here and saying that, look, uh, if you're going to be doing any data set collection, uh, it has to pass like IRB and those kinds of steps. So the funding agencies and, you know, Google and all of the big AI companies kind of hand out a whole bunch of money uh, for, uh, you know, in, in order to support faculty research. And I think those all should come with like caveats. Uh, That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, really um, think that would uh, address a lot of it. Uh, yeah, there is an irony that um, social scientists like myself have to get IRB approval to just interview people, um, yeah. talk in a room together where uh, no approval is needed to uh, gather human data. Well, um, so I'm going to go over to the uh, audience Q&A. Um, start with a... Uh, Interesting question. Sounds like it is from a uh, another technical person, David, who asks if you can uh, offer any recommendations about ethics or ethically informed researchers. Um, anyone who could offer advice on their work they're doing on deep computational analysis of speaker and person recognition in television news. So it sounds like live motion video, um, facial recognition, any uh, advice there? Um, I, I, I'm kind of blanking out on that person's name. Uh, he's a professor uh, at Cornell and uh, I did meet him at uh, the CV Cops workshop at CVPR. Um, I'm also kind of curating a, a list of who to follow and who the leading lights are uh, on the GitHub thing that uh, I think I shared the QR code somewhere uh, in the beginning of the talk. So um, uh, I will be adding all of these, uh, you know, curating all of these lists. I didn't want to kind of put it out a priori without getting the feedback from the community and knowing what I can, what I shouldn't be sharing. Um, but uh, there are people who are working on this exact problem and uh, they've actually looked at it from different angle. Uh, one of the things uh, that I would like to highlight is that there's a threat of like adversarial perturbations in the video space as well, where if you want to kind of auto summarize what happened in a video clip, then you can kind of do these sinister attacks where every fifth frame you kind of poison it with like a dubious frame that kind of completely changes uh, what the summarization of the video entails. Um, CV Cops is a, a very interesting workshop that happens every year uh, within the gamut of workshops in uh, CVPR. And I think a lot of the researchers kind of, uh, you know, publish their, uh, there are actually two professors. I'm kind of having a brain fart moment right now. Uh, one at uh, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, the other one at Cornell who are working on exactly this problem and i'll kind of make it a point i, I made notes here to kind of uh, share it on github cool very cool thank you um so we've got a few questions here on uh similar technologies um that you didn't uh directly address but in a few different domains and so i wonder if you might comment on if you have any concerns um say for instance around uh emotion recognition as opposed to facial recognition or specifically in a domain like uh, the use of facial recognition on security cameras in K through 12 schools. Um, so, you know, social areas where this technology is being used or yeah. different elements of biometric recognition. Uh, what are yeah. your thoughts there? I have uh, very strong opinions um, and I had like a personal conversation with uh, uh, I would like to not name that person as such. Uh, he's a professor in uh, Colorado, uh, where they were saying that this can be safely carried out um, by basically uh, using a technique where you kind of blur out the face and then uh, only the blurred out face. And, and the reason is because of the fact that uh, they said that a lot of the drugs were actually being sold in 
public restrooms. So they wanted to kind of install these cameras, which is like privacy aware cameras. And to that, I would basically like to say that, look, uh, when, I, when you look at the data set, it's only part of the face, it's kind of blurred out. Uh, and there are some visual clues available from the neck and stuff like that. So uh, you can kind of look at it as a challenge given to the community uh, that's working on state-of-the-art architectures for denoising autoencoders, right? Uh, or like uh, in in filling uh, or in painting uh, problems where you basically uh, collect a, a whole bunch of this data with the ground truth uh, images, and then it's a matter of time. So any technology that you kind of uh, you know say that this is privacy guaranteeing, please be aware of the fact that it has ephemeral utility. Um, and uh, to say that, you know, uh, even with, when it was not called computer vision, but it was called image processing, you had so many of these face occlusion techniques, which we now know, and that these face, face blurring techniques, which are supposed to guarantee, uh, you know, your the privacy. And uh, for that, I say, it's only a matter where, where someone gets hold of your technology and basically corrects both the ground truth data and the, you know, the blurred out data and just basically try, kind of trains uh, an in painter or an auto encoder that basically or like an image to image converter, uh, which can kind of uh, overcome the blending effect to an extent that the person's identity becomes revealable or you are able to expand uh, or narrow the key anonymity guarantee that you initially peddled your technology with. All of these have a very ephemeral, uh, you know, lifespan. Uh, and I think they do this in a couple of uh, the papers, even within uh, motion sensor research, where they think that adding a little bit of noise kind of uh, ensures that you people won't be able to reverse engineer uh, the identity of the device because all of the mo smartphones you kind know, of ship with uh, motion sensors that have idiosyncratic biases uh, that can be used to fingerprint the device. And we have actually seen that it, it takes like a three layer simple <laughs> uh, you know cnn to basically kind of uh, learn the noise representation and learn how to remove it so uh, to say that i'm kind of skeptical about the fact that uh, these technologies uh, well within differential privacy with provable guarantees like if you say if you're doing uh, one of the papers that uh, one of my colleagues uh, wrote sometime back involved dphe um, uh, which basically involves uh, doubly permitted uh, homomorphic encryption that actually has provable guarantees. I'm not kind of referring to that uh, literature, but some of these, uh, should I say, Chosky tricks where they say that, oh, I have this idiosyncratic uh, blurring effect that I can kind of make uh, use to kind of make this uh, face blurry and hence I'm guaranteeing the privacy of that person. I'm going to take those claims with a grain of salt. Wow. So what is potentially private and secure now will not be in the near future. Yeah. Wow. So um, we've got um, another question here that, um, on that note about uh, <clears throat> the uh, face to speech and speech to face. And this touches on um, uh, the broader uh, issue of is this science um, or is this a kind of 19th century uh, vision of science? Um, and what kind of scientific basis? Um, would you say is legitimate? Um, is is there one here? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, yeah, it is not science, is it? Um, <laughs> correlations, uh, sure. Um, I have done a whole bunch of projects, uh, but uh, I, uh, you know, like, okay, you can kind of do this, right? You take the speech to face model, right? And then, you know, there was this one guy on Simpsons who used to play the voice of Apu, you pass basically pass that and uh, it's funny like it actually kind of spits out an indian looking image which was uh, so you're kind of literally kind of uh, distilling all of the biases that are already existent um and you can kind of do so many experiments like we took the ethnicity classification problems and then we took uh, the images of uh, certain tribes in sudan that have the epicanthal fold um in the middle of africa and then we pass it through the ethnicity classifier they were all confidently predicted as asian um, and, you know, the people who have basically looked at this, uh, you know, from the viewpoint of like, uh, you know, uh, like interracial studies and um, in, in humanities, they, were, uh, they have done so much work to, and it's all of those tropes are actually just being reimagined and, uh, you know, basically sprinkled with a little bit of linear algebra here and there and basically sold as AI. It's, it's uh, yeah, I, in my opinion, it's, it's basically, you know, pseudoscience. Uh, yeah, yeah yeah so to to wrap it up um in in your talk you uh focused on uh at the end there um 
the relationship with the media and artificial intelligence in particular has had a long and interesting uh, relationship with the media. So you've worked with journalists. So to, to wrap us up here, I wonder if you have any thoughts, uh, suggestions for best practices on both sides, you know, what journalists can ask of technical researchers and also how technical researchers might work with journalists to make uh, public more aware of some of this research. Yeah, uh, well, from the researcher side, uh, I think if I, I would be lying if I say that I didn't want my paper or work to kind of I don't know, go viral. And there's actually another angle to this here that I would like to kind of uh, point out that very few people think about. A lot of the vision or the AI ML researchers uh, happen to originate from, um, you know, who are immigrants, uh, India, China, uh, Iran, South Korea, and so on and so forth. So oftentimes when, you are, when we have to apply for visas, uh, let us say if you want to apply, uh, if you want to you not know, go through the H1 nightmares and if you want to apply for O1 or convert to green card and stuff like that. The sad thing is uh, the government demands to you show your worth, not in terms of peer reviewed scientific publications, not in terms of citations or anything of that sort, but show me which mainstream media outlet actually cited your work. That is one thing that I wish, uh, you know, a lot of the people who point fingers towards researchers say that, oh, you know, don't try to pretend as if you didn't want this fame. It's not so much about the fact that we, some of the researchers that I've actually spoken about or spoken to wanted them, you know, kind of to market themselves, but it's so unfortunate that in order to apply for visa and stuff like that, I'm not trying to say that this is, uh, you know, an excuse by any stretch of imagination, but there's this one angle that I wanted the community to know that your worth as a researcher has to be demonstrated to the government, both mostly in terms of like the, which media outlets, which mainstream media outlets actually covered your work. Uh, so it, it's a very, it's very hard to kind of go and talk to a researcher who might be doing this to ensure that he or she might be able to stay in the country to say that, hey man, there are these ethical ramifications, don't talk to the media and uh, irrespect and don't ensure that they write a flurry article about your research. On the media side, I think I sometimes do see the point that if you are trying to be too much of an iconoclast, you get casted as a pariah. This is literally what the, the journalists have told. Uh, in fact, the exact statement was that uh, in order to win the larger war, you have to kind of lose a few battles on the way. So you will have to kind of patronize some of the big labs a bit and not be too questioning because uh, you know then you know that you will probably not uh, be invited to you have to a network to kind of get ahead, right? There are so many papers that talk about the fact that the reason why great painters have been deemed to be great painters is because of the network effect. Like who would, who did they kind of collide, collude with in the early days of their career in order for a researcher to be known as, uh, you know, like an emerging researcher, it has been shown that you have to kind of publish in your early days of your career with some of the stellar names in the field. So the network effect is actually very strong. So the I see the model conundrum that many of the uh, journalists, uh, you know, kind of have in the sense that if you kind of are able to uh, hop knob with uh, some of the bigger AI labs, then there's a stronger uh, kind of, um, you know, career trajectory that they will get to experience. Um, but I do wish uh, that, I, I think uh, we should certainly support, uh, you know, some of the sensationalism surveys um, that uh, you, the University of Washington people uh, are actually carrying out and uh, maybe the solution there is like some kind of a, a browser extension which talks about which kind of gives you a score like you know how Snopes does uh, where in terms of like giving truth or not truth maybe it's time to come up with like sensationalist non-sensationalist um, and yeah so, I mean this is some of the thoughts that I had. That is great and uh, thanks so much I wasn't aware of that government visa requirement that is incredible yep um, I had no idea um, and I've learned quite a bit else today, as I'm sure everyone else has. So thank you, uh, Dune, and thanks for everyone. Uh, thanks to everyone else for joining us on our Friday seminar. It's really been great, and the recording will be made available online in the coming weeks. So let's give a virtual round of applause to Dune, and we'll see you this uh, next time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Colin. Have a nice day. <laughs>